We're going to continue our discussion of continuous distributions by talking about the beta distribution. So the beta distribution is a little bit different from the normal distribution. So the normal distribution gave you a distribution over all real values, but the beta distribution only gives you probabilities over the range 0 to 1 inclusive. This allows the beta distribution to model anything that looks like a probability. So this could be the proportion of people in a country with a disease, the probability of an unfair coin, or say a batting average. The beta distribution has two parameters, alpha and beta. We'll talk about that in a second. The density function of the beta distribution is x to the alpha minus 1 times 1 minus x to the beta minus 1. And this looks a lot like the density function of the Bernoulli distribution. But it's important to keep what we're modeling straight. In the beta distribution, we have a density over a continuous value. So x can be anything between 0 and 1. Even though the Bernoulli distribution looks a lot like that, x is either 0 or 1. It's over discrete outcomes. We'll talk more about why they look so similar in a second. So now let's take a look at the beta distribution for various parameters alpha and beta. And so you get something that looks a little like a Gaussian distribution if you choose alpha equals 2 and beta equals 2. That corresponds to this purple line here. And so here you have something that looks a little like a bell-shaped distribution, but you'll notice that the probability goes all the way down to zero at the edges. There is no long tail. The probability goes not just close to zero like in the normal distribution, but exactly to zero. The second you get beyond zero, the probability is zero. So anything to the left here is completely impossible as an outcome of the beta distribution. If you choose alpha equal to 2 and beta equal to 5, you get more of a skewed distribution. So this means that your outcome is more likely to be in this range, so close to 0. But again, as you get close to 0, the probability gets very, very small. So it's not going to be exactly 0, but it's going to be a small number, probably less than, say, 0.4. Other parameter settings are more interesting. So, for example, let's take a look at the red line here. And so this corresponds to alpha and beta both being equal to 0.5. And so when alpha and beta are less than 1, you get a bowl-shaped probability distribution. And so this is basically saying that the probability is going to be close to either 0 or 1, but either one of those outcomes is equally likely. Thus, it's symmetric. You can also have distributions that are peaked at only one of the edges. So, for example, if you have alpha equal to 5 and beta equals to 1, you have this blue line here, which ramps up very quickly and peaks at 1. So you're very likely to have probabilities, outcomes of the beta distribution that are 1 or very close to 1. So now that we've seen the shape of the distribution, let's take a look at how we get a function that generates that density curve. So here we have a normalization term, just like we saw for the normal distribution. We can pay attention to the rest of it for now and ignore the normalization term. And so here we have x raised to the alpha minus 1 times 1 minus x raised to the beta minus 1. From this, you should be able to tell that alpha and beta have to be greater than 0. And you can tell you get special values when alpha or beta are equal to 1. And when alpha and beta are equal to 1, parts of this can go away. So when beta or alpha are equal to 1, we get special cases. So for example, with the blue line on the previous slide, where beta is equal to 1, we basically have x to the fourth if alpha is equal to 5. And so then you get a curve that goes up sharply and peaks at 1. And you should also see when if you have alpha 
equal to beta, you get a symmetric function. And so if you have alpha equal to beta, and let's say for uh, the sake of argument that it's equal to 2. So then you have x times 1 minus x. Then you should see that this is a symmetric function around 1 half. And so at 1 half, the left hand side will be equal to the right hand side, and then they'll flip. And so uh, then 1 minus x will look like the left hand side, and uh, 1 half will look like the right hand side. So when you have alpha equal to beta, you have a symmetric function. So let's now return to that scary normalization term in front. And so you see the Greek letter gamma there, and so that is called the gamma function. And the gamma function is a generalization of the factorial function that we talked about before. But unlike the factorial function, which is only defined for integers, the gamma function also works on real numbers, which is why you can have arguments like 0.5, which are possible values of alpha and beta, being passed into the gamma function. The expected value of a beta distribution is simply alpha over alpha plus beta. And so if alpha and beta are the same, the expected value is going to be 1 half. So just as we generalize the Bernoulli distribution, we can generalize the beta distribution. So the beta distribution can be thought of as a distribution over things that could be probabilities. And we can generalize that further. So recall that we had things like the categorical distribution, which were probabilities over k different outcomes. And so just as the beta distribution gives us a single probability, the Dirichlet distribution gives us k probabilities that define a probability distribution. That is a vector over k things that sum to 1 and are non-negative. So if you write out the Dirichlet density function, it looks like this mess down at the bottom. So you won't need to worry about this. On any exam, you'll be given this distribution if I ever wanted you to use it. Just know that it exists and it provides a distribution over vectors. So what are the kinds of things that you can draw out of a Dirichlet distribution? Let's get a little bit more intuition about that by seeing some examples. So one way of visualizing a Dirichlet distribution is as a triangle. Here we have a distribution over three things. So think about this as a vector x1, x2, and x3. And so a Dirichlet distribution will be vectors that correspond to some distribution over three possible outcomes. So one possible draw might be, say, 1, 0, 0. So this corresponds to a distribution that says only the first outcome is possible. And we can draw that as a point on a triangle like so. Another possible outcome is a distribution that only gives us probability for the second event. And similarly, we can have a point here for the third event. So these are the extreme outcomes of a Dirichlet distribution, but the Dirichlet distribution gives us anything inside this triangle as well. So this point here at the edge corresponds to 0, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. And a point in the very middle corresponds to one-third, one-third, one-third. So we can draw the probability distribution as the height within this triangle. So if we set all of our parameters of a Dirichlet distribution to be one-third, we get 
a distribution that looks a little like this. So this is basically saying that the most probable outcomes are the corners of the triangle. That is, we're going to have a vector that is high in one coordinate and low in all the others, but it doesn't particularly prefer any one of those corners over the others. One thing that often confuses people about the Dirichlet distribution is that the parameter of the Dirichlet distribution is a k-dimensional vector. And the output of a Dirichlet distribution is also a k-dimensional vector that is a probability distribution, say a discrete probability distribution. The parameter, however, to a Dirichlet distribution does not have to be a distribution itself. You can have any vector of non-zero numbers as a parameter of your Dirichlet distribution. So, for example, let's say that all of the parameters to your Dirichlet distribution were 2. And so the sum of that vector is 6. That is not a probability distribution. Nonetheless, you can have that as your parameter to a Dirichlet distribution. And if the parameter of your Dirichlet distribution looks like that, this is the corresponding distribution. And so notice that it bulges in the center. So remember what's in the center? That is the probability distribution 1 third, 1 third, 1 third. When all of your Dirichlet parameters are the same and greater than 1, then that means that you're saying that the most likely outcome is going to be around the uniform distribution. So just as we saw a connection between the beta and the Bernoulli distribution, there's also a connection between the Dirichlet distribution and the multinomial distribution. And so both of them have a similar form when you write down their probability mass function or their density function. And so remember the analogy that beta is to the binomial distribution as the Dirichlet is to the multinomial distribution. And one thing that we'll see in this class is that it's useful that they have these similar forms. And this means that we can chain them together. And this is often called Bayesian data analysis. We can make some assumption that we have a parameter that comes from a Dirichlet distribution, and that then gets used as a parameter to a multinomial distribution that provides us with observations. So we'll see, for example, in naive Bayes, we'll make assumptions about our probability distributions, and those assumptions correspond to assuming a Dirichlet distribution. Don't worry about that for now. Let's explain how we can tie these two distributions together. So in particular, what we're going to use is something that looks a lot like the chain rule. We have a Dirichlet distribution that gives us a multinomial parameter theta. So the multinomial parameter is the output of the Dirichlet distribution that gets fed into our multinomial distribution, and then we observe a bunch of counts from that multinomial distribution. And so let's say that you know what your counts are and what the Dirichlet parameter was. Now you want to figure out what that multinomial parameter looks like. And so if you take those two nasty probability functions that we had and ignore the normalization terms, you get a formula that looks like this. And so you'll notice that I've written the symbol for proportional to here. And so this is basically saying that we know this is a probability distribution. It has to sum to 1. Let's just ignore all those nasty normalization terms and just care about the things that depend on what we've observed. And so in particular, the counts and our parameters. And so if we look at the probability of our multinomial parameter, given what we've observed, then the probability function looks like you're adding the Dirichlet parameter alpha plus the number of counts that you've observed. And this is why it's useful that the beta distribution looks like the Bernoulli distribution, and the Dirichlet distribution looks like the multinomial distribution. In statistics, this is called conjugacy. So you have one distribution called the prior distribution that's giving you a parameter. That parameter gets fed into another distribution, 
and then when you condition on data, that new distribution is called the posterior. If the posterior looks like the prior, that's called a conjugate distribution. You don't need to worry about that since this is a statistics class, but if you see that or hear me say it, that's what I'm talking about. Essentially, conjugacy means your life is easier. So before, when we were talking about estimating, say, a distribution over words, I just told you to add one. So why did I tell you that, and why is it not so crazy an idea? So if we assume that we have a multinomial distribution whose parameter came from a Dirichlet distribution, what does that mean in the case of adding one? So let's go back, and let's look at this term again. And so if you take your Dirichlet parameter, and you add in the counts, and subtract one, that becomes your new combined distribution. So what does that mean? So let's go back to the functional form for the Dirichlet distribution. If you add one to everything, if you add one to all of your Dirichlet parameters, what distribution does that correspond to? So take a look at this, and think about it for a second. If all of your Dirichlet parameters are 1, what happens? So if all of your Dirichlet parameters are 1, then this term basically doesn't matter anymore, because you have theta k raised to the zeroth power. And so in the add 1 case, we're basically assuming a Dirichlet prior, because we take our counts and we add 1 to them. And so what we have added is the Dirichlet parameter, and if the Dirichlet parameter is 1, then that means the Dirichlet distribution is uniform. It weights everything equally, no matter what that theta is. And so if we go back to those pictures I was showing you earlier of the triangle, that corresponds to everything being flat on that triangle. That triangle is often called the simplex. This encodes probability distributions, and if your Dirichlet parameter is 0, then the simplex has equal values for all of the thetas that you plug in. All of those thetas correspond to points within that triangle, and no point is more probable than any other point, because you're just going to take that vector, then raise it to the zeroth power, which always gives you 1, and then you're going to normalize that with the normalization term out in front. So this concludes our whirlwind tour of distributions. We'll be putting these various pieces together as we build models to do fun and interesting tasks in data science. But keep in mind the intuitions that we built about these distributions, because it will help you in turn understand the models and why we're making assumptions about the models when we're putting them together for applications.